Let's hear it for our uh, Cross Canada crew of student activists and uh, activist journalists. We have as your featured speakers tonight, uh, Chloe zawadzki Turcot, uh, one of the key organizers behind the, the student strike that kicked Jean Charest out of office and yeah. kicked ass on the Quebec uh, elite and neoliberalism. So let's hear it for Chloe. You also have uh, a face that you've probably seen demonized in the mainstream media, uh, given a proper voice and hearing in the alternative media like rabble.ca. We have a feature piece up on our front page uh, today by Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois, who is our other speaker tonight. Uh, our other speaker, um, a former representative spokesperson for class and still a student and an activist. Um, and the third speaker that has made up this seven city, uh, seven, seven day maple tour that has whipped across the country, um, a whistle stop tour across the country, is uh, Rabble's own correspondent uh, in Quebec who has followed the whole student strike and also the election. Um, so you, hopefully you've read some of his stuff. If you're here tonight, uh, and if, if you haven't, uh, we're gonna strongly recommend it. You're gonna hear from Ethan Cox later as well. I should probably tell you who I am again. I'm uh, Derek O'Keefe, uh, the editor at rabble.ca, and uh, Rabble as a uh, alternative news organization, or not even alternative, but trying to provide the news for the real majority in Canada for the, the point of view that is not represented in, represented in our corporate press, nor in our parliamentary electoral setup. Um, Rabble has been around since 2001, and uh, for a website, that's pretty old, so we, we like to think we're still healthy for our age, and uh, looking to, to what's new and exciting. So when the Maple Spring happened, started to really emerge in March with a quarter million people on the streets, um, we knew this was a very important thing, and that's why we, we hired on Ethan to specifically cover the, the Quebec student strike and those historic events. And um, so our editorial position and our interest in bringing uh, readers, especially in English Canada, the truth about what was happening in Quebec, because you wouldn't find the truth in post media, uh, and you certainly wouldn't find it on the at issue panel on CBC News, which uh, poo pooed or demonized or made fun of and dismissed the Quebec student leaders uh, for weeks on end there. Uh, either pretending nothing was going on or just a bunch of young people rioting was going on. Um, so we really strive to, to bring the truth and that's why we're, we're proud to put this tour on. Um, and we're lucky to have the, the founder of Rabble.ca, the founding publisher, um, Judy Rebick, who in 2001, along with other activists and uh, journalists and media activists, decided that the setup of the corporate media wasn't good enough and something had to be done. Um, and they, they founded Rabble.ca, and we're, we're very, very fortunate to have Judy here tonight to kind of set the scene and um, just uh, introduce our three uh, featured speakers from Quebec. So I'm going to ask Judy Rebick to come on up. Give her a warm welcome, please. you got to get better steps, eh? Sorry. Thank you. I'm very excited to see all of you here. I've been kind of excited lately. You know, last time I went to the world premiere of Occupy Love, in case you didn't notice my t-shirt. And uh, I was excited about that too. I feel like I'm about seven years old. Um, anyway, um, so I'm really happy to see all of you here because it is Thanksgiving week and I know everybody goes to Gulf Islands and things like that on, on Thanksgiving weekend. Um, I, I, I just want to say that uh, I want to talk about how I feel about this tour because um, I've been working to create an alliance between activists in English Canada and in Quebec for a, a very long time. In 1975, I was part of a group called um, the Committee for uh, the Self, the Committee for Support of the Self-Determination for Quebec uh, during the referendum. Because what happens in Canada is every time there's a referendum or a rise of nationalism in Quebec, the uh, powers that be, the federal uh, powers that be, and this often includes the NDP, um, create hysteria about the possibility of Quebec leaving Confederation. 
And I have been part of a very small group trying to counteract that for, how long ago was 1975? <laughs> 35 years. And I always say that to be, it used to be to be in favor of self-determination for Quebec in English Canada is kind of like being a pacifist in the Second World War. It's not, <laughs> it's not a, a very popular position. So, and you know, as, as many of you know, I've been an activist a long time. We've had a lot of success in the women's movement. We've had some success in anti-racist struggle and the labor movement and lots of other areas, but not in this area. And every time we managed to build some support, like we did in the women's movement around a number of issues, up comes a you know, rise of nationalism, boom, it disappears, or a forget it, forgetting of, of what we went through before. So this is, so the first thing I want to say is that I was like beyond thrill, thrilled, sorry I'm a little, uh, I'm wiped out because I was partying till two in the morning and I haven't done that in a long time. Okay. Um, I was beyond thrilled when, uh, when Ethan came on uh, as a correspondent at, in Rabble and Rabble started to report on the Maple Spring because if you didn't read French, there was just nowhere to find out what was going on on the Quebec student strike. And I was lucky enough to be in Quebec for the March 22nd, the first really huge demonstration. And it was the biggest demonstration that I'd ever been on except for May Day in Cuba, you know? And so, and it was, not only was it big, but it was joyous, it was joyous. And it was mostly young people, almost entirely young people. And they were just amazing, it was amazing. And even though I had just recently broken my shoulder, I really, I, I, re I just loved it. And I realized something big was really happening. Uh, it wasn't just an, a student strike, although student strike's important. And I, I, want, and I want to say that, and I'm gonna be real short because I'm supposed to be, that um, the leadership, and I know we're not supposed to talk about leaders, the spokespeople <laughs> of the student movement, and I think they are leaders, but a new kind of leader. I think that's how we have to think of it. The spokespeople of the student movement, and in particular, Gabrielle is the one that I saw the most, um, were absolutely brilliant leaders of social movements. They were, they never took a wrong, like an, I watched very carefully, I never saw a wrong step in the whole struggle. And the pressure was enormous, enormous, like personal attacks against Gabrielle from the premier of the province, you know? Attempts to divide the three student groups, um, pressure from the media, and they continued. They were resolute, as we might have said uh, some time ago. They were resolute, they were calm, they were together, and they were totally democratic. General assemblies decided every major decision. It was spectacular, really spectacular. And then when the Casserolius Canada happened, it was like for me a dream come true, I have to say. <laughs> uh, it was a dream come true. I'd never seen that happen in English Canada in all these years. There's never been a real solidarity movement with Quebec. So what I wanna say is I'm so happy about this tour. And there's two elements that have to happen to have solidarity with Quebec. And one of them has happened now. Quebec has uh, shown the way to the rest of us, how to organize this kind of struggle, not only win their demands, defeat the government, put pressure on a social democratic party to actually do what they say they're gonna do, and you're gonna have to keep up the pressure, I think you know that. But more importantly, we have a mass organization being the class that's reaching out to English Canada, and that has never happened before. So that's important. And so we have to respond in kind. And that's not only by continuing to organize solidarity, but if and when there's a rise of the national struggle again, if and when the federal government decides to raise hysteria about Quebec sovereignty, all of us have to now say no. We might not agree on sovereignty, but we agree on everything else, and we don't agree with the federal government, either uh, repressing Quebec, creating hysteria around Quebec, or trying to divide us, we will no longer be divided uh, on, on national grounds. And that's up to us to do and to stand for self-determination. So thank you for coming, thank you for doing this tour, and thank you all for being here. Hi, everybody. 
Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal to see, uh, to see this large of a crowd. Um, this is our seventh stop uh, on a national tour to, uh, to try and talk to people about what happened in Quebec this year and, uh, and how inspiring it was. And, uh, and it's just lovely to see uh, so, many, so many faces in the audience today. It's, uh, this, this tour has really exceeded our, our wildest dreams. Um, at every stop, we've been greeted with a generosity of spirit and a hospitality that, that was impossible to, to expect. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's really been touching and wonderful, I think, for all of us uh, to see and to be able to connect with and meet and talk to such, such strong and inspiring activists across the country. And, uh, and I think if there's one thing about what happened in Quebec this year that's most important, it is that this is not a case of Quebec exceptionalism. There is no reason why you cannot do the work and organize and build social movements that are as strong as the one in Quebec here and in other parts of the country. So um, I'll just back up a little bit and, and say that, uh, that how I got involved this year is that uh, I was the Quebec director with Brian Topps at NDP leadership campaign, and obviously that didn't go very well. <laughs> And, uh, and so when that was over, I, I was kind of looking around and going, okay, what do I want to do? And, uh, and I, I, I was like, well, you know, there's this incredible social movement that's happening right under my nose. So I think what I really want to do is, is figure out some way to make a living while, while being involved in this. And, uh, and I was lucky enough, uh, thanks to Rabble and thanks to leadnow.ca, um, to be able to spend uh, most of this year um, covering that, that strike and that social movement. And as incredible as it was to see from the outside, I'm sure, um, it, it's impossible to describe what it was from the inside. And especially after the passage of the special law and, and after the casseroles started. And, uh, and my colleagues here like to make the point that, uh, that it's important to know the limitations of social media. And that social media is a great tool to spread information among the converted, but not to convert people. And that's true. Um, but you know, this, this, this casserole protest, it was a totally new thing. It wasn't like a traditional thing in Quebec. It came from Chile. And, and it was started by a CJEP professor who started a Facebook group. And within a couple days, people were in the streets at 8 p.m. every night across the province. And my parents live out in Rigo, which is a little uh, boondock uh, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and I was staying out at my parents' place for a couple days, and, and I heard casseroles. In, in the middle of nowhere, and there were casseroles in, in every region of the, of the province. And, and it was the closest thing I've ever seen um, to, to what was described, I think, very well in a banner that led a lot of classes demonstrations, which said, this is not a student strike, this is a society waking up. And, and to see that sense of social solidarity, especially in those casseroles, when, when just about everybody came out and said, no, this is it, this is enough, um, was absolutely phenomenal. And um, I won't talk too much about the nuts and bolts of the strike, because that's uh, for, my, uh, for my dear friends here to do. Um, but, uh, but what I wanted to do was, was to put what happened in Quebec in the larger context. And uh, I believe strongly that the, the most critical um, problem facing us around the world right now is the austerity agenda, which you can call neoliberalism, which you can call runaway capitalism, which you can call a broken system but a system in which governments around the world are uh, slashing taxes on corporations and the rich, transferring government revenue into private pockets, and then turning around and going, whoops, sorry, there's no money for you know, social programs. Ah, oh, too bad about healthcare, too bad about education. Um, and I think that, um, that the, most, the most important element of this, uh, of this strike is that it was, if not the first, certainly the largest victory against that austerity agenda. And I think that so often what stands in our way is, is not that we cannot achieve things, but that we think we cannot achieve them. And, and so often people, you know, nobody, Gabriel wrote this week that, that in his travels across the country and, and internationally, it doesn't meet very many people who don't think there are big problems. But people often think that, that they're too overwhelming, that it's impossible to, to affect change, that, that why bother, right? And, and fair enough, it's hard to motivate people if they think that, their actions are going to have no difference. Um, but we desperately, desperately need to resist this agenda. 
And we desperately, desperately need to take action, for instance, on climate change, which is going to kill us all really soon if we don't do something about it. And, and obviously in BC, I think, uh, I think there's a very strong environmental movement. But uh, this, uh, this austerity agenda has proceeded largely unchallenged. And where it has been challenged, there haven't been decisive victories. And so I think what's critically important about Quebec is that this can be the, the first pebble that starts an avalanche. And that once people see that by working together, they can win and they can take back control of their societies. I'm very hopeful that that will motivate people across the country and around the world to, to take part in social movements. And I think what's also really important to understand when we're talking about the austerity agenda is we have a common enemy. Um, we have a common problem. And, and for those of us who are working in the environmental movement, the labor movement, the student movement, the feminist movement, the indigenous rights movement, what have you, whatever your movement, the problems that we're facing in those movements are, are caused by the same thing. And that's a fundamentally broken system. And so I think that it's also really important to take away from what happened in Quebec how critical it is that we work together. If we all fight our separate battles within our own movements, we're all going to lose. And the way that we win is we unite, we work together, we bring all of those movements together because it's power that we need. And power comes from mass mobilization, from mass movements. And the way to do that, I think, is to bring people together. Um, <laughs> so, so all that to say that I hope you, you walk out of here tonight, and I hope everybody watching online thinks tonight that, that Quebec shows us that we can win, but it requires a lot of work. And these guys will tell you about the years of work that were put in. Um, so just before I turn it over, I wanted to do one other thing, which was talk briefly about education. And um, it's important to understand a little bit about education funding, because how the strike was portrayed in the media and the rest of Canada in particular was terrible. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this tour, was to give people an honest view of what actually happened. Um, but people tend to say, oh, these students are cute, you know, education would be nice, but it's a completely unattainable pipe dream that would cost ridiculous sums of money, so how naive. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. In Quebec, completely free education is estimated to cost around $350 million a year by uh, one of our main social, social policy research groups, which is less than 3% of the annual budget of the education ministry. It, it couldn't be more peanuts. And it's also the best investment we can make in the future, even if you do not believe, as I do, uh, that education is a fundamental right that its importance and its value cannot be assessed monetarily, but it is a measure of our, of our level of civilization, the extent to which we educate without cost and without what have you. Even if you don't believe in that, there are a number of studies that show that for every dollar invested in post-secondary education, the government gets back $10 over the lifetime of a graduate and the higher taxes that they pay. So um, there is no perspective except an extraordinarily short-sighted one that does not recognize that education should be free can be free. And that's the case across the country. Um, and so don't let them tell you that, uh, that education is, uh, is inaccessible. So um, I won't go any, on any longer. Um, the people you are really here to see are my, uh, my colleagues here. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Chloe Zavadsky-Turkut, uh, who is a member of the Executive Committee uh, of CLASS and also a member of the Mobilization Committee. And the Mobilization Committee was the beating heart of this strike. Um, so she doesn't have quite the same public profile that Gabrielle does, but she was every bit as instrumental in, in making this happen this year. So can we have a big round of applause for Chloe? I'm very happy to be here. It's been a, it's been a long tour, exhausting but fun and very uh, very rich. Uh, we've made very uh, rich meetings with a lot of people uh, all around Canada. So for me, it's a good experience. After having seen a lot of people involved in Quebec uh, for for this track, now I've seen a lot of people in, involved in the rest of Canada. So that's pretty encouraging. Uh, so uh, my presentation is going to be more about the nuts and bolts of what happened in Quebec. I'm going to start by a historical review of what happened 
uh, in the years before the strike started, because of course it wasn't just a spontaneous movement that started in last February, has been prepared a long time before. And then I'll go more uh, by explaining uh, the structures of the student movement in Quebec. <coughs> so to start, um, if we want to understand what happened in Quebec in the last winter, we have to go back to 2010. 2010, uh, in April precisely, when uh, Mr. Raymond Bacha, who was the, finance, uh, the Minister of Finance at the time, announced the budget. So uh, it was a budget that contained a lot of austerity measures, of course, including uh, the famous uh, tuition hike. So at the time, uh, people in the student movement, especially in the class, uh, decided to go see some of the community groups that were more progressive, uh, environmental groups, feminist groups, uh, and some local labor unions also, to work with them uh, to fight against this austerity budget. So <coughs> that's when we can say that the movement started uh, precisely by a big demonstration that this coalition of, of uh, community groups and student groups uh, organized <coughs> that was on the 1st of April of 2010. So uh, this was a, a big demonstration. We were about 30,000 mil uh, not millions, 30,000 people uh, in the streets of Montreal at the time, and a lot of the students were on strike also that day. So that was, uh, let's say, the kickoff for the movement uh, that uh, continued for the two years uh, after. So <coughs> um, what followed that big demonstration was a lot of work on the campuses of the, of the, the universities and the CEGEP uh, in Quebec. So um, the class organized massive, massive uh, information campaigns and mobilization campaigns all around Quebec to inform the students that, um, sorry, that the, 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 the tuition increase was going on and to explain to them why it was a bad thing and how was it made exactly. Because at the time, <coughs> a lot of people either weren't aware that the hike was going on or either were not against it necessarily. At the time when we would go on the campuses to talk to people about this, the tuition hike, let's say that 10 to 15 percent of the students in the campuses were actually against the hike, just so you know. And that was two years before the strike happened. So nothing's impossible. <coughs> so what we did is, as I said before, we organized not only uh, massive information campaigns by distributing some flyers all around of the campuses, by going to speak to the students in the cafeterias, in the classrooms directly, having some conversations with them, not only on Facebook, but uh, we also organized lots and lots of workshops uh, so that the students that wanted to be more involved could have some uh, tools to not only be informed themselves, but also to start uh, mobilizing and informing, uh, informing the others. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> yeah, sorry, I have a bad cough. Um, and what we did was not only, of course, information campaigns, because information campaigns are not enough if you want to fight against the government. So what we did was we started by smaller actions. At first, we would uh, sign some petitions uh, against the tuition hike. We would organize some visibility actions, uh, dropping some banners, <coughs> organizing some citizens uh, to attract the, uh, the media so that the people could be aware that uh, of the tuition hike and could be aware that we were organizing a movement to resist against it. Um, after we did those, those smaller actions, uh, the students in the General Assemblies <coughs> decided to go a little bit more further to build up the pressure more and more ag against the government. So we would start doing more direct actions, organize some, uh, some days of strike, uh, uh, during the semester, for, for example, we would do one day of strike to organize a demonstration, a smaller demonstration at the time, but just to say that the movement 
was growing up, uh, growing up and up uh, to, to resist the hike. <coughs> so that was for the first year. After this first year, we're going to May, May 2011, the student uh, movement, well actually the class, decided to organize a big meeting in Quebec City where we invited all of the local student unions of all the Quebec. So not only the student unions that were member of the class, but also the, the student unions that were member of the FEC and the FERC, <coughs> which are the two other main uh, national student organization in Quebec, and also all of the others that were independent. So the purpose of this meeting was to get in touch with all of the student unions so we can uh, <coughs> talk to them about our strategy to fight against the tuition hike. Because of course at the time, not all of the student unions were very active and prepared to fight against the hike. So it was important for us because we knew that we couldn't fight that, that increase alone. So we had to get in touch with them <coughs> to get them informed and uh, have a coordinate strategy to fight against the hike. So that's also at, the, uh, at this moment that we started uh, to speak about the strike. Because <coughs> until that moment, we were building up the pressure by doing smaller actions, but we knew that probably the government uh, wouldn't listen uh, just uh, after these small actions, so we would maybe have to go on strike. So at the time, we told the other local student unions, um, well, you know, <coughs> if this is not enough, maybe we will have to go on strike. And at the time, there were very few students organizer that were uh, in favor of the strike, that were prepared to do it, that thought it was gonna be possible. Everybody was afraid of it. But still, uh, we, we encouraged them to have the debates in their general assemblies. And so the discussion went on and on. <coughs> and also, at the end of this meeting, we decided to organize, uh, in, co in partnership with the other national student unions, a big demonstration again. And uh, on the 10th of November, 2011, that was gonna be an ultimatum that we were gonna send to the government. So, what we wanted, what we wanted to say was, this is our ultimatum. This is our last warning. If you don't back off after this demonstration, we are going to go on strike, and not one day of strike, we are prepared to do an unlimited general strike uh, in the winter. <coughs> so um, so we, we, again, we had to do huge mobilization campaigns uh, to mobilize people for that demonstration, but also to begin to speak uh, to the students about the strike, because at that time, <coughs> a lot of them had been informed of the tuition increase, and a lot of them were, were against it at the time, but not uh, too much of them were <coughs> aware of what a strike was or were in favor of it, because a strike represents huge uh, personal sacrifices. So we had to convince them one by one, and we, we started this mobilization precisely on the strike, on the method, after the 10th of November, because on our huge demonstration, we had, again, 30,000 people in the streets of Montreal, and more than 100,000 students on strike that day, and the government still didn't listen, still didn't back off. <coughs> to us, the message was pretty clear, but it seems that uh, Mr. Charret didn't understand. So, <coughs> sorry. So, so when we got back in school in January, all of the students on the campuses were aware that a strike was possible. They were not necessarily in favor of it, but they knew that it could happen. So <coughs> the debates uh, on the strike began to be real in the General Assemblies. It was serious now. It wasn't just an idea uh, far away. It was beginning to be real. So people had huge debates. And uh, <coughs> with a lot of work again, uh, massive, massive, massive mobilization campaigns. We were on all of the campuses all over Quebec, all the time distributing flyers from 6 a.m. 
not from 6 a.m., from 7 a.m. when the people <laughs> get... <laughs> from 7 a.m., yeah, because school starts at 8 o'clock in the CGEP, so we be there in advance. Um, yeah, so we had to... I'm, I'm distracted now. <laughs> to be sure to speak to everybody. We'd go in the classes all the time so that people were convinced not only that the strike was a bad idea, but that we had at the moment to go on strike to fight it because all of the other strategies had already been used in the, in the two years before. So, well, it worked. Uh, students were convinced and we went on strike. Now, before going to the other part, the part more about the structure, I want to take a little time to explain exactly what does a student strike represent. Because <coughs> I know that there had been a lot of misunderstanding of what a, stri a student strike was. Because a lot of people know about labor strikes, but a student strike can be uh, you know, confusing as a concept. <coughs> So um, actually, it's not that complicated. A uh, student strike looks a lot like a labor strike. Uh, for some people, uh, the strike was only a series of, of protests and some people doing some actions all over the streets of Montreal. Well, this is not exactly <laughs> what a strike is. Uh, a student strike is actually uh, a collective decision that is made by the students uh, that are represented by their student unions to stop going to class. So when you do a strike, it means that everybody that is re represented by a union that votes the strike democratically in their general assembly stop going to school. <coughs> so that's why sometimes we even had to do some picket lines to be sure that the strike mandates were applicated uh, in the CEGEPs uh, and in the universities. So why, why did we use the strike? Why <coughs> is it an efficient method? Well, when you do a student strike, it means that you have a massive amount of students that are supposed to be in class that are not. But at the same time, you still have to pay the teachers. You still have to pay the people of the administrations of the CIGEPs and of the universities. And this is a huge cost uh, for, for, for the government because the, the universities and the CIGEPs are, are publics. So it's the government that pays all that, night, all that time for nothing. So when you do a strike, you actually speak the language of your enemy, and that language is money. But yeah. So now th when we do a strike, we hope they, they understand because we speak their language. <laughs> it's not enough sometimes. But uh, yeah, so that, that's for the strike definition. So now I'm going to speak more about uh, the structure of the student movement, because it's also been <coughs> extremely, uh, an extremely important factor uh, in the success of the student strike. The structure of the Quebec student movement is, is uh, particular uh, in comparison of the rest of the Canada. <coughs> And to us, it is one of the main factors that explains the success that we had uh, this spring. To us, um, the structure, the democratic structure of the student movement is at the very basis of the building of a massive movement. Because it's because it's very democratic that people feel that they have to get involved and that people feel that when they get involved, uh, they're listened to because they are the ones that directly take the decisions of whatever happens during the strike in their general assemblies. So that's what makes it so massive. But what makes it so powerful is also that there's a certain form of centralization uh, <coughs> in the movement. So the structure is at the same time <coughs> Sorry, very democratic, but at the same time structured. Uh, we have some executive councils that, that make sure that the decisions of the general assemblies are applied. We have a, uh, we have a coalition of student unions that make some decision with some 
structures that are pretty rigid. And that's what makes the, the movement so powerful, because at the same time, you have a structure that's important, and you have the democracy that's also important. <coughs> so more precisely, how, how is the movement structured? Well, you have, uh, in Quebec, you have the CEGEP and the university. After you go to high school, after you graduate from high school, you go to CEGEP, and then if you want to continue, you go to university. So <coughs> in the CEGEPs, you have uh, one student union that represent all of the students in the CEGEP, which is about, uh, well, a few thousand people. And then in the universities, the structure varies from one university to another, but to keep it simple, you have some student unions that represent uh, all of the departments in each university, and then sometimes you have uh, some student unions that represent the faculties in the university, and then uh, sometimes, but not, uh, not all the time, you have one big student union that represents all of the students in the whole university. So how do, they, uh, how do these new unions function now? Well, they all, they all work the same way, basically. All of the decisions of these unions are made by the members, by all of the students in the, in the General Assembly. <coughs> so the General Assembly is the main uh, decision-making uh, body of, of all of the student unions. And then when the, the members uh, take some decisions in their general assembly, uh, these mandates, as we call them, have to be applied by an executive council that represents the union, but that has no other power than all of the other members of the union. <coughs> and then that's on a local level. On the national level, you have all of the student unions that are represented by the class, for example, by a coalition of student unions. And all of the decisions that are taken by this coalition are actually taken by delegates of each student union in a Congress. But the important thing to understand is that <coughs> in the Congress, all of the delegates that represent the student unions cannot take a decision on a personal basis. They, uh, they always have to respect the mandates that are given to them by their general assemblies. So that's what makes the structure so democratic. Because in the end, it's always the members that take the decision. <coughs> um, so to us, again, that's why our movement was so powerful, because everybody felt involved in it, because everybody, uh, like every student, was an active part of the decision-making process. Um, I'll finish uh, <coughs> on a note on the, mo the mobilization process. Uh, because <coughs> the movement was so strong, because it was, uh, it was democratic, but um, it was also strong because of the way we organized our demands uh, towards the government. We could have chosen <coughs> to try to make a strike against neoliberalism, because in the end, that's what we're against. That's what we're against. But uh, to us, it, it wouldn't have worked because the demand would have been too large and uh, the people wouldn't have thought that they could actually, uh, you know, <laughs> what, run against neoliberalism. It's a pretty hard thing to do. So what we chose to do instead was to choose a very specific demand, which was stopping the hike. It was our slogan at the class, Ensemble bloquons la hausse, together log the hike. So <coughs> people all felt in the unions that this goal, they could achieve it. By doing the strike, they could log the hike. And it's important to people uh, that they f if they, it's important for the people to feel that they can achieve the goal that you're, uh, that you're having because if they're not, they don't feel that way, well, they will never accept to go on strike because, as I said earlier, a strike is involved a lot of personal sacrifices, <coughs> academic sacrifices, uh, financial sacrifices, I can tell you, and uh, it, it's a hard thing to do. So. You have to choose a very specific demand, a unifying demand 
that all of the people that get involved uh, in, the, in the way you act against it feel that they can achieve. And then <coughs> the other thing to remember is it's, it's that it's always important to keep in mind the more systemic uh, context that goes around this specific demand. Because all of the students in, the, in Quebec were all aware that <coughs> the, the tuition hike wasn't an isolated measure, that it was part of a much broader concept. And they were also informed of this, co of the, of this context uh, in the information campaigns that we would do, in the workshops that we would do. But in the end, what they were fighting for was not abolish neoliberalism, was to stop the hike. And that's why they chose to get involved. And it worked. We had, we had the, a right strategy, it seems so. So um, I'm going to let you with my colleague, uh, Gabriel Nadeau-Dubois, which you may know already. He's going to speak to you more about uh, the, the more philosophical, the f philosophical context of the hike. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you um, very much, uh, obviously, first to you for being here tonight. Thank you also to the sponsors of these stores, because uh, without them it would have never been possible to do that, that wonderful uh, conference around Canada, obviously. Some unions such as the CAW, CEP also, and obviously Ravel.ca that organized the store. My colleague and friend Ethan, who was the main uh, organizer of all that adventure. And I, will, and I want also, I was not supposed to do it, to do a special uh, word for Judith, which, are, which I particularly uh, appreciated the word in which, uh, with which she began that meeting. And I want to say that as a proud Quebecois, I think that what she said is very important for us if we want to be able to, to be sure that the system, that this economic system that is destroying the national cultures around the world can be defeated. What we, all what we all need to do in order to fight against that system is also be able to recognize that the national attempts of the peoples of the world to save those cultures is not a different fight for, than the fight for social justice, but that in fact, it is the exact same fight. And I want to thank Judith for saying that. So uh, Chloe probably did the uh, how part. How did we uh, mobilize in the last years in Quebec? I'm going to try to do more of the, uh, uh, the, the, the why part. Why did, the, did, did we mobilize? What for us was uh, underneath and behind that really specific measure of increasing tuition fees by 75% in Quebec? Um, to understand that, I want to start by telling you a little bit about the context in which this tuition increase was announced. Like Lois said, the, um, the increase was announced in 2010 by, finance, by former finance minister of Quebec, Raymond Bachand, in a, in a much larger budget, which contained also a series of austerity measures and privatization measures of public services in Quebec. And, what is very interesting is that a few days before the budget was adopted, finance, former finance minister Raymond Bachin uh, presented his own budget in a newspaper by saying that it was going to be for Quebec, and I quote him, a cultural revolution. And, I've, and we, obviously it's funny to, to hear a liberal uh, minister using a Maoist term to describe <laughs> his own measure, but. It's not only a joke, it's also, I think, very interesting. Because by saying that, Mr. Bachin was admitting that the objective of his budget was not economic, was not uh, financial, that the, the objective of his budget was cultural, or let's say, ideological. That, that, was, that, what, uh, that the motivation behind it was not to f put more funding in the public services, but that, in fact, the objective of his budget 
was to change the very political culture of Quebec, was to change the role of the state in Quebec society, was to change Quebec society itself by attacking uh, his historical social democrat system based on mechanism of redistribution of wealth, uh, a, a system that we all know is not perfect, obviously, but that still permits to reduce the, uh, the difference between the rich and the poor. And the objective of that budget was clear. It was to break that political culture and to change it for, let's say, a more Anglo-Saxon model of private services funded not by a progressive tax scheme, but by user fees. And it's very interesting to, to, to see that, in fact, the, 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 the former finance minister was admitting that fact very, uh, very clearly. He, he even talked about May 68, and he compared his own budget to May 68 to say, we're going to change Quebec. Yeah, obviously it's funny, but and uh, and but it's very uh, it's very uh, inquietant. It's very inquietant also. Um, it's quieting. Yeah, it's quieting. So uh, Chloe talked about the structure of the movement. He, she talked about how we did it. I'm going to try a little bit to explain what what was our arguments, what was our political analysis, and I think that I can see we had two major arguments. The first argument is pretty simple, and you all know it. It's that if you increase tuition fees, you will actually reduce accessibility to post-secondary education for working class children and middle class children. And uh, it can seem obvious to us, but in the media, the opposite thing was said everywhere. You probably saw that charts when uh, you, they would compare the tuition fees in Quebec to his uh, university participation, participation rate. And they would say, you see Quebec as one of the lowest tuition fees in Canada. In fact, we have the lowest tuition fees in North America. And also, Quebec has one of the lowest uh, participation rate in, in his universities. So then they would say, you see, there's absolutely no link between the price of education and the participation rate of the population in the, in the post-secondary, no, in the university system. Uh, and that was a very shocking argument that I think scored a lot of points in the public opinion. This argument is wrong for three major reasons. Uh, the first one is that this specific statistic hides other realities because accessibility to education is not only the number of students that go to universities, it's also who are those students. Where do they come from? From which socioeconomic background do, do they come from? And when we look at those statistics, we see that there is a clear difference between the socioeconomic profile of Quebec students and of English Canada students. For example, in Quebec, we are the province in Canada in which you can find the more students from middle class in programs like medicine, pharmacy, engineering, those, those, big, uh, those big programs. It's also the place in Canada where you can find the most students from remote areas, from faraway regions in which there are, you, there are no universities. And obviously for those students, it, the cost of education is higher because to go to university, they have to, to you know, go out of their community, get an apartment, find a new job. So obviously the cost of education for them is a lot higher. And Quebec is also the place in Canada where you can find the most first generation students. It's the place in Canada where you have the more students that are the first of all their families to actually go to university. In Quebec, more than 50% of students are first generation students. That means that we are still in the process of democratizing post-secondary education. We are in the process of opening the doors to universities and increasing tuition fees was obviously a way to begin to close them. So that's the first that's the first reason why this argument is wrong. The second one is that this 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 statistic of university participation rate actually hides a, 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 an undeniable difference between the Quebec education system and the, and the rest of Canada education system. In Quebec, as you, like you probably know, we have this very unique institution from which we are really proud as, as students that is called the CEGEP, which is a transitory and mandatory college between high school and university. And what is the effect 
on that in, of that institution is that if, for example, you want to become a nurse in Ontario, you actually have to do a four years degree in university. In Quebec, if you want to become a nurse, you, you go to CEGEP, which is free, and that's really important, and you become a nurse. So the impact of CEGEP is twice. The first one is that it reduces the duration of our university diplomas from one year. So obviously there's less people in universities. It's, it's, it's less long. But also it makes that a, a big range of professions can be accessed without going to university. So it's also the, 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 the second reason why this CEGEP as a direct the, the existence of, of the CEGEP has a, a clear impact on the university participation rate. But also, let's say, let's find another statistic to really evaluate the accessibility of Quebec's education system. Let's take not the university participation rate, but the post-secondary participation rate. Let's see in the provinces what is the percentage of the population that actually will go to school after high school, because that would be a way to uh, to, to go under the difference between the Quebec and the Canadian education system. And when we do that, the results are shocking. Quebec has a 10, well, a 9% 9% advantage in post-secondary accessibility on the rest of Canada. So when the right wing was telling us in Quebec that they wanted to reach the Canadian average of tuition fees, that would probably mean that we would also reach the Canadian average of post-secondary participation rate. And that obviously would not be a good news for the students of Quebec. So that's the, and also that's the second reason why the argument is false. And the third one that is much more subtle is the fact that, for example, in Quebec in medicine, uh, one student out of four are, are accepted. That means that four times more students apply in medicine than the, actually, than the actual number that will have a diploma in medicine. So even if we would triple the tuition fees, the medicine classes would still, would still be full. So the, the fact that the, the, the uh, tuition fees would have tripled would have no effect on the number of students that will actually have a diploma in medicine from the Quebec universities. It will be the same amount of, of students. The problem is that those students won't be the same. They won't come from the same families. They won't come from the same socioeconomic backgrounds. So that why, that, that's why I was saying before that accessibility to education is not only the number of students you have, but is our, 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 is our students representative of the actual society? Can we find people from all the social classes in universities? And like I thought, like I think I have proven in Quebec, it is more the case than in the rest of Canada. But that does not mean that we don't have to go toward free education, but let's say that for the moment, I think we are in a better situation. So that's the first argument, the argument about increasing tuition fees is actually clearly an attack to accessibility to education. The second argument that we used to mobilize was a much more uh, systemic one. It was to say that, in fact, the tuition increase was only a symptom of a much greater disease. The fact that the increasing of tuition fees had to be put in a much larger context of, let's say, commodification of post-secondary education all around the world. Uh, it's a, I won't, I'll, I won't have the time to explain it totally, but I'll try to do a brief overview of that context. Like you, like you probably know, since the end of the post-Second World War economy, since the end of what we have called the Fordism compromise, uh, our northern economies have a lot changed. Like you all know, most of the manufacturing sec sector of our economies have been sent in the south, mainly in South Asian countries. Uh, the impact of that is that our, uh, our northern economies do, and, uh, do not work anymore on actually uh, you know, manufacturing things, physical objects. Uh, the, ma the majority of that production has been uh, displaced in other countries. So that's why most of the economists says that we have, entering, we have entered a new phase of global capitalism, which is what is called knowledge economy. Our economies are more and more uh, uh, in fact, let's say profit and growth in North America and Europe are, are less and less based on actually f making things, but more and more 
on developing ideas, developing new technologies, and then put and then putting a patent on them, so you, so the corporations could make profit when those ideas and technologies are sent south to be manufactured. But there's the big problem with that new knowledge economy. The big problem about that economy is that it needs a huge amount of research and development. And there's a problem with research and development. It's that it's very, uh, it costs a lot. You need a lot of investments, but those invent investments are really risky. Because you never know what you're going to get in the end. You have to invest billions of dollars without knowing if you will actually find this new concept or this new technology that will make you rich as a corporation. So historically, the corporations are reluctant to invest those, mass those massive amounts of money. So what we have seen since the beginning of the 80s is the corporations turning themselves towards an institution that is funded publicly, that is filled with young brilliant minds, young, brilliant researchers that are only asking to be funded to do research, to find new technologies and, uh, and new ideas. And that institution, as you may have uh, thought, is university. So we have, seen we, we have seen big corporations putting more and more attention towards universities in order to, uh, to make them integrate the global economy. That's why you will never hear one uh, commerce, cha uh, commerce chamber? One, chamber commerce. one chamber of commerce or one uh, big corporation association say that universities are not important. In Quebec, it was fascinating to see how the, uh, how the uh, chamber of commerce were all, all agree that education was the future of Quebec. But obviously, when they talked about the future of Quebec, they were talking about the future of Quebec's economy not about the future, of, about Quebec's people. And when they were actually talking about university and education, they were also talking about economy. But there's a problem with that process of integrating universities into capitalism. There's a problem because universities at the first place were not, were not founded to do that. They were not taught as, you know, an economic, uh, as, as a body of economy. So if you really want to integrate them into economy, well, you have to change a few things. You have to change, well, because, you know, philosophy and history of art, not, not really productive. So you have, you have to change the institution if you really want to integrate it into the market. Let's say that you have to do two major uh, revolutions inside university if you really want to make sure that they are integrated into economy. First, you have to privatize the funding of the universities. And second, you have to privatize the very activities or, let's say, the very nature and mission of universities. What is wonderful with the tuition increase is that it does both. It, it privatizes the funding and the activities of the universities. It privatizes the funding and that's very, uh, it, it's very obvious because all around the world when tuition increase have, for example, increased by 30%, we have seen public, f public funding going down by 30%. So when we're being said that the increasing of tuition fees will bring more money into the education system, it's objectively false. What happens systematically everywhere in the world when tuition fees are being uh, increased is a proportional uh, fall of the public funding. So tuition increase is not about making, it's, it's not about putting more money into universities. It's about changing where does the money come from. It's about changing from a public funded university to a university funded by individuals and also philanthropic participation of the big corporations. And this new philanthropic uh, funding of universities has an impact already on the activities of, of, of universities because obviously when a corporation is going to fund the university, they're, gonna, they're not going to fund all the university. They're going to fund a specific faculty a specific program, sometimes even a specific course. And I, I've always seen in Quebec corporations funding a specific teacher for a specific course because they knew that that program and that teacher would give them a return on their investment. Because obviously, what other reason would, co what would bring corporations to invest in education than obviously looking for a return on their investment? So. 
It's clear to see that when you increase tuition fees, you privatize the funding of the universities. But when you increase tuition fees, you also privatize the very activities and the very nature of, the, of universities. Because when you increase tuition, the first impact is to create debt, student debt. And debt is a very, very efficient disciplinary process for human beings. When you know that, you will, that going to university will give you a 40,000 student debt, well, obviously, you will choose very carefully your, your university, and you will choose very carefully your program. And what criteria will guide this choice? Obviously, economic criteria, criteria of return on your investment. So in, if you increase tuition fees, you will naturally bring students, even uh, very generous left-wing activists like me, if you, if you increase tuition fees, you will, you will you will, in fact, force the students to begin to shop their own education. And when you are able to put in the mind of a 17-year-old young adult that, in fact, education is nothing else than investing on his own human capital, if you are able to, make, to put in the mind of that young, that young adult that the only use of public education and public institutions like university is to benefit them, well, you are seriously beginning to form the perfect, even the more than perfect consumer for, for, for the 21st century global capitalism. Because when you, when you give birth to a, 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 a youth with debt, you actually create an obedient youth. So briefly, in the process of privatizing the universities, the economic elite has to obviously change the funding of universities, like I said. But they always have to change, the, they also have to change the activities of the universities, and in the third time, they have to change the relation between the subject and the institution, between the student and the university. And that, exact, and that is exactly what the effect of a tuition increase is. It begins to form adults that will, that will see, not only in their education, but more generally in their teachers, in their colleagues, in, in the public services in general, not a, partici a way to participate in common good, but a way to improve their own individual. So something is very clear. By increasing tuition fees, you do not destroy the historic nature of public education, you, in fact, begin to destroy society. Because you put in the mind of the citizens that the others around him are only there for their own benefit. And that there's nothing that, is ex that, that exists as a common project or a common ideal. So that's a little bit what we saw behind the tuition increase. I had written some more things, but I spoke too much, so I'm going to end now. By, by just saying to you that all those arguments that I've explained, all the structures that Chloe have explained, um, and all those assemblies, all those congresses, all those protests, uh, it, uh, are one of the reasons why the Quebec student movement has won. But I think that the main key, and it's very simple and maybe obvious to say that, but the main key of our victory, I think, was the amount and the enormous amount of work that has been done by thousands of activists in Quebec in the last two years. It may seem a superficial conclusion, but I think it is not. Uh, when I talk about work, I talk about being at the gates of your university at 7 a.m. each morning for two years, distributing hundreds of thousands of flyers and of newspapers, talking to everyone in your cafeteria, you know, doing everyone in the cafeteria, waiting 30 minutes so that there will be new people, and then doing it, and doing it that, and, and doing that, five times in a day, each day, for two years. That's what we did. It's, and you know, you won't, like Chloe said a little bit, and like Ethan said also, put a campus on strike with Facebook. And I wanna, and I wanna say it, because I think it's probably the, one of the main traps in which my generation could fall, to think that social medias, as attractive as they are, as efficient as they are to mobilize, you know, punctual events, to think that those medias could convince people to move can, can, could convince people to, to, to mobilize. And thank you.
And I want, I want also to say that, you know, if I was standing here uh, one year in the past, uh, I would never have said that I thought that we would have a strike. Never. We were, I was personally, and we were, I think, as surprised as everyone by the level of mobilization of our own generation. After hearing for so many years that we were an individualist and cynical generation, you know, sometimes you begin to believe it. And the only cure against this discouragement is work. There was a time, I remember a few, few times uh, uh, before the strike, when the, uh, the printer of my local student union was actually printing papers uh, between 14 and 15 hours per day, like nonstop printing, and not, like nonstop printing for, fi for 15 hours. And at the beginning, we were not many to, to pass them out. But we did, we passed all those flyers, student by student, campus by campus. So if there's only thing, only one thing that I wanna express here, only if I have one, one only thing to say to you is, is that very simple advice, and it's to never, never stop working, never stop mobilizing, never stop talking to people, never stop killing trees and passing hundreds of thousands of flyers. <laughs> And then what happened to us will probably happen to you. And then it will really surprise you. You will, you will see your brother, you will see your neighbor, you will see your colleagues actually talking about the flyers. You will see new faces in the street with you. You will see red squares on the balconies. You will see slogans, political slogans, written on the walls of your university and of your, uh, and of your town. You will even see a prime minister scared by a bunch of students. And, that, and when you will see that, you will know clearly that you just won. Thank you. they like you. <laughs> so uh, we're going to move to a, a question and answer period in a second and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Derek. Um, I just wanted to take care of a couple uh, a quick pieces of housekeeping, especially because this is the last event of the tour and, uh, and because it's also live streamed. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate, um, as Gabrielle was saying, this tour would not have been possible without the support of our, our national tour sponsors. Um, we've, we've had a whistle stop tour from seven cities in, uh, in seven days and obviously flights are expensive. So I really want to single out and thank the, the communications, energy and paper workers and the Canadian Auto Workers Union for their significant support of this tour without which it would not have been possible. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Lead Now, uh, the Council of Canadians, and uh, literally dozens of, uh, st of union locals, uh, student unions, um, community organizations in cities across this country who, who gave us little bits of money, who helped to organize events, and, and who really made this tour possible. And um, also, uh, I really think it's important to recognize the contribution of Derek O'Keefe, uh, who's the editor of Ravel. Um, <laughs> He, uh, he worked tirelessly with me for several months uh, to organize this tour. He's, he's one of the best activists that I know, and, uh, and I'm so pleased to be able to work with him. And, uh, and lastly, and, and most importantly, um, I'd like to thank Gabrielle and Chloe, um, because, uh, you know, I, I knew them a little bit before this tour, but for the last seven days, uh, there literally hasn't been one second where we have not been together. 
So if we had not really gotten along well, it would not have gone well. <laughs> And um, I, I, I was so tremendously inspired and in, impressed by both of them long before I met them, um, by the poise that they demonstrated, the incredible work that they did. Gabrielle is a spokesperson going into the most hostile of media environments and never once placing a toe wrong. Um, and I think that, um, that as Judy said, um, they may not be leaders, but, but they certainly are inspirational um, Really, really, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that if uh, if if we're going to save the world, and if we're going to if we're going to take the fight to austerity, we're going to do it on the backs of this generation, and we're going to do it on the backs of of people like these two activists here, who are some of the best people that I know in the world. So let's have a big round of applause for for Chloe and Gabrielle. So much. Um, we are going to move to a Q and A. Um, I was looking for uh, two young activists who were going to open the night with an important announcement about an upcoming climate justice conference in Ottawa that Gabrielle is actually going to be speaking at. Power Shift 2012. How many people have heard of Power Shift 2012? Oh. Yeah. All right. Not enough of you. So <laughs> this is worth getting excited about too. Believe me. And um, I know uh, these two activists from Quebec really want to make. Uh, connections with the burgeoning and growing and powerful uh, climate justice movement, anti-pipelines, anti-tar sands, export movement that is really sweeping and building power right across the province of BC and, and throughout the rest of Canada. Um, if they blocked the tuition hike in Quebec, we're going to block Enbridge and we're going to block Kinder Morgan. And, uh, and, uh, And now we're going to, uh, and, and now we're we're going to hear from these uh, two really sensational uh, young activists, inspiring people. Uh, three or four years ago, I was uh, in my previous stint as editor of, of Rabble. Um, I had a chance to, for one week, I had. Um, interns, I guess, or, or workers from a high school in, in East Vancouver, from Windermere High School. And uh, these two students were part of a group of, of four who had convinced their teacher, I think it was four of you, right? Who had convinced their teacher to let them do their work experience at rabble.ca for grade 12. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was late in the school year. They were about to graduate. I asked them, like, what are you going to do for the summer after you graduate? You know, just hit the beach or whatever uh, before going to university. And they were like, oh, we're organizing a cross Canada tour to raise awareness about the tar sands. We're going to go up to Fort Chip and meet the indigenous people, and we're going to organize all summer. So, and they did it. And uh, it's a few years later now, and now they're organizing for Power Shift. They're just going to tell you a little bit about it and how also they've been inspired by the movement in Quebec. So, this is Neelam Kare and Peggy Lam. Come on up. <laughs> and, uh, for the Q&A, I'll be the guy. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Hey, folks. Uh, I just want to start off by acknowledging that we're on unceded Coast Salish territories, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. My name is Neelam, and I'm a local organizer, a student community organizer. And, um, I just really want to thank um, Chloe, Gabrielle, and Ethan for, for, for that talk. And um, oftentimes we hear about the end results of a movement, and it was really helpful to hear the beginnings of it um, so, that we, so that we can do that work here and also be inspired by what you've created. Um, so we really appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. Do you, want me to, you go for it. Oh, yeah. great. Thank we you. haven't really planned this, so this is on the, on the go. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, so my name is Peggy, um, and I'm also a local organizer for PowerShift 2012. Really like to thank you both for um, spending your time here to talk about stuff like that with us today. And um, as a young organizer and as a student attending university right now, I could tell you that you're a great inspiration and um, the movement that happened in Quebec is definitely something for us to work towards and look up to here in BC, for sure. Um, just want to start off by, so 
like Neelam said and like how, uh, what Derek was talking about, we want to build a huge uh, student movement here in BC. And we want to build a stronger collective student voice. So this is why we're here to talk to you about PowerShift today. Um, I'll briefly go over what it is. So PowerShift 2012 is a climate justice conference happening in Ottawa Gatineau from October 26th to 29th. And what has been happening is that a, um, a bunch of young people across the nation uh, are hoping to bring 1,500 youth um, and people from our, all across Canada to this climate justice conference to build a climate justice movement um, and politicize our uh, youth voice. So that's what it is. Um. <laughs> That's worth some applause, I think. <laughs> so, it's part of it's, yeah, go, going, it, we're trying to get a delegation out to Power Shift and have a national conference and talk about a lot of these really important issues. Um, and also there's like this feeling of excitement that's starting to grow uh, with a lot of the students here. And uh, it started off earlier this year actually um, in March uh, where there was a, a student walkout and the university students were working in combination in, um, with high school students. And, um, and hundreds of students were basically got together and were saying that Christy Clark, it's not okay for you to uh, continuously cut the budgets of education and not negotiate with the BCTF. And so uh, a lot of students started mobilizing. And, um, and so that was like an, a really tremendous feeling of like walking down the streets with hundreds of other students and over um, 10 different places in BC from Prince George to like Victoria. And, um, and oftentimes like, sometimes it does feel like especially in university you're like it's it can feel really isolating especially when you're in a huge amount of student debt and you have like your own concerns and so there's this there's a strong need for a collective voice and a lot of us are really um, recognizing that and I think I for a long time I really underestimated my peers and um, seeing the passion and the energy that that a lot of my peers have I'm really um, excited um, to start creating that a uh, collective voice and power shift is just one way of doing that um, and um, we're hoping to raise funds for it as well too I don't know if you want to speak more about it Sure, <laughs> I get the fundraising pitch, yay. <laughs> uh, uh, no, seriously, and um, the reason why I'm so uh, hopeful about Power Shift 2012 is that I really like to reflect back on the times when I was sitting in a high school classroom or even a university classroom, and I wonder um, throughout my life, what was that moment for me that got me really engaged and want me and um, got me wanting to really do something about it and really instead of just listening to things, taking action about things. And I thought about it and it did not happen in one specific moment. It happened in educational programs uh, outside of school, organized by peers and students and amazing mentors and role models that really inspired me to do something and really told us that as youth and young people, we have that capacity and power to change things and that we are so brilliant and and we could be innovative about doing that. So for me, that was the thinking back on that, those were the things that really clicked. And this is what we're really hoping to do with Power Shift, to bring young people together so that we could really inspire each other and really learn from each other and really shift power, P bringing power from the top to the bottom and organizing from the grassroots so that young people could bring these skills back to their communities to mobilize. Um, and so. <laughs> Um, and so doing that, we really do need your support. I know that with this, um, with many events like this, you'll probably hear a lot about pitches about fundraising and support, but for us, this is also a really important cause. Um, we'll be handing in some flyers. We're hoping to bring a delegation team from BC to PowerShift and are hoping to raise funds like around $5,000 to be able to sponsor uh, youth who are really passionate but don't have the means to go. Um, yeah, so that's the fundraising pitch. And also we'd like to talk about PowerShift 2013 and that um, this conference is the beginning of a movement and we hope to extend the skills that we gain from organizing this uh, beyond a three-day conference and really bring it back to the communities and organize long-term to stop uh, devastating projects such as Enbridge and um, Kinder Morgan pipelines and so on, you know, thank you.
Well, thank you uh, both very much. Um, I think it's really incredible for us in particular uh, to, see, to see students who are, who are so active and engaged uh, out here as well, and that's really awesome. And I may be a little biased, seeing as how I used to live with two of the national organizers of PowerShift, but I think it's incredibly important. Um, Gabrielle's obviously going to speak there. I think all three of us will be there, um, and, and I, 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 really, I really support what you're doing, and, and I think PowerShift's terrific. So uh, please, if you can help out there, uh, do so. Um, I believe they're going to be handing out flyers, um, so I would suggest the best way to do so would be to, to talk to them directly. Um, so uh, the question and answer period is going to be brief, however you are all invited to join us for a drink upstairs um, after the event. And uh, just before we move on to the question and answer period, um, I believe somebody's going to find a hat and pass it around. Um, as you can imagine, this has been a very expensive tour and despite our sponsorship, uh, it's still a lot of costs in terms of flights and, and cabs and stuff, and especially when you're moving fast. Um, so so, uh, so obviously you've all already dug deep to, uh, to give us some money at the door, but if anybody has some extra cash that they don't know what to do with, um, please feel free to chip it in the hat and we would, uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to start taking questions. Um, Derek is going to be roving with a microphone, so you shouldn't be looking at me for recognition, but rather at him. <laughs> and uh, Derek, once you have a, a question, uh, go ahead. Oh, 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 yes, and uh, one thing that's important, uh, we want to get to as many questions as possible, so please make sure that you're asking a question and not making a statement. Uh, people have a lot of questions. We want to make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. Are you going to point people out? No, no, you do it. Okay. <laughs> Here, let's, uh, let's bring the, the chairs up behind the mic. I, I, I want to uh, express my appreciation as somebody f sort of from three generations uh, older than, the, than you for uh, the inspiration and uh, the rediscovery of uh, democracy and uh, the ordinary characteristics of people uh, that they really need face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. But my question uh, relates to the trade union movement. I know there was a difficult relationship between the student organization and the trade unions. And I'm wondering if you have any observations to share on the impact of the success of your struggle and the way you organized on ordinary members of the trade unions. Uh, yeah, well, the, the first I, I want to say that there is a historical and very uh, long relationship between the student movement in Quebec and the labor unions. We have very strong, not only solidarity links, but really working links with uh, unions in, uh, in the world of education uh, in particular. And they have been there, they have been supportive uh, all, uh, all during, the, during the big majority of the strike, mobilizing with us, being there publicly also for us uh, giving financial support also because as a very uh, small student, co student organization to be able to do that strike for six months was you can imagine pretty expensive so they were also there uh, to, to help us financially. Um, one of, and to specifically answer your question you know one of the impacts of our strike was to not only make our ideas like, like social justice and accessibility to education popular, but also our way to organize was publicly diffused more than ever. And, what, and I can tell you a, a very real story. A, a former president of one of the big, big labor unions in Quebec came to, to, to saw me the other day and told me that, you know, after you, we will never be able to work the same way. Meaning that because we have taught so much about direct democracy, about you know the membership controlling the movement and the strategic orientations of the union from the beginning to the end of the strike, that their membership, hearing us say that, uh, were more concerned than ever by controlling their own labor union. So I think that that's one of that, that's going to be a part of the heritage that we, that our movement will have, will have left is to not only diffuse our theoretical ideas but also make our our way to organize. Uh, more popular and more effective in the student movement and in other social movements, just like the labor union and I th uh, the, the the labor union movement. And I think that's that's one thing to mention that um, I th I think we have contributed in democratizing also the the labor union structures.
I, uh, I uh, have a short question. I arrived here, I'm sure, I hope, uh, like a lot of other people, because the uh, way that this meeting was built was that building on your success in Quebec, we were going to be trying to build a cross-country coalition of people who would be now taking on Harbor. Um, I have a number of uh, tree-killing leaf. Well, actually, we only killed a few bushes to make these leaflets in my uh, hand to hand out that echo a, lot, a number of the things that you said. Um, but we have to, at some point, get together. Like, uh, is there anything envisioned coming out of this meeting or the series of meetings across the country to actually issue calls for people to come together into community labor coalitions to begin this fight back? Uh, yep, that's, uh, that, that was actually the, uh, one of the objectives of, of this conference, to, is to maybe put the basis of something like what happened in Quebec more on the, on the federal level uh, against the, co the conservative government of uh, Stephen Harper. But uh, I, I want to say something that we succeeded in Quebec uh, to build a coalition of social movements, but that was very difficult. That was very difficult because to be able to, I, w I will start from the beginning. We, we, we succeeded in building a coalition of social movements, and we succeeded, in, we succeeded in also in building a common agenda with common objectives from all the, from all the, the social movements and labor unions. But the condition to build that common agenda was for each movement to do a compromise. Because if we, if we say, okay, we build a, a national coalition of social movements against Stephen Harper, one, can, one of the conditions of that is that each, each organization is able to understand and to say that maybe this year my particular demand it will not be the priority of that coalition. So th there's a huge need of compromise that is necessary to build that kind of, al of, of, of alliance. Because sometimes it will be the student movement, sometimes it will be the women movement, sometimes it will be the student, the labor unions, to say, well, today, let's you know, focus on one thing and let's beat the austerity agenda measure by measure. Because that's the way our enemies are working, so maybe that's the way we should also work. And, but you know, to, to be able to do that compromise, one of the conditions for this compromise climate is a confidence climate between the social movements. Because you won't do a compromise if you're not r deeply convinced that the other organization in front of you will be able to do the same compromise the year after. So you have to be sure that everyone around the table is really there with the intention of, m of you know, mobilizing on social issues and not and you have to be sure that no one is around the table to use the power of mobilization of the organization for only their own corporatist demand. And you need so a very big confidence climate between the organization. And to build the, the, the confidence climate, you need not only the leadership of each organization to meet, but you need also the membership of each organization to meet and to concretely work and you know, uh, organize together. And in Quebec, this coalition started uh, in particular from that experience of the memberships of the organizations reaching each other. Um, and that happened during uh, what we have each year in Quebec, that is the Quebec Social Forum. The Quebec Social Forum is a, it's on the same model as the international social forums where you have all the social organizations of Quebec coming together and you know, when I say organization, I mean the activist and the membership of the organization talking together and establishing strong links. So I deeply think that one of the first step in order to build an, a, a Canadian alliance of social movements is to begin for the first time to organize a Canadian social forum uniting the three nations of this country that are Canada, Quebec, and the First Nations. And I think that if we're able to do And if we're able to organize such an event and make really the activists from each organization 
go together and work together, then it will be probably one of the first steps to establish the confidence climate, which I talk about, which I think is the condition for any real and concrete solidarity between social movements and not only press releases to say that, you know, your strike is cool and your pipeline thing uh, is cool. So, uh, just before we go on, um, up, I've been informed that uh, the Rabble live stream has also been picked up by Occupy Earth and about a, a half dozen other uh, websites who are also live streaming this event. So, if there's anybody who's watching the live stream who has a question, you can tweet it at me and I'll try and get to some of those. And it's at Ethan, E T H A N, Cox, C O X, M T L. So, if there's anybody watching the live stream that has questions, you can send them in that way as well. And the, and the hashtag again is Maple Tour. Uh, all one word. So, um, so if you're tweeting about this, uh, Maple Talk. Sorry, one other housekeeping announcement. And if we don't get to your question in the Q&A, there's going to be a social after. People are welcome to stay and have drinks. The bar over here is also open. So please, uh, you know, uh, support W2 and uh, en enjoy yourselves tonight. Uh, still got a long evening ahead, even if the Q&A is not going to be that long. We have a question right here. Oh, thanks. Um, and congratulations to you both for your hard work and dedication and thank you for doing it. Um, I actually just was wondering about your general assembly and I was interested in hearing more about um, your direct democracy that you mentioned and wondered, for me watching from here, sometimes it appeared that there was a lot of division among the students and I just wondered um, if you could talk a little bit about how you overcame that and you know, how some challenges of using direct democracy and how you overcame them. Uh, so yeah, uh, one particular thing about the student movement is which uh, I talked earlier, is the direct democracy. All of the decisions in the student movement are taken by the students in the general assemblies. So of course, uh, sometimes there are some divisions among the students, um, <clears throat> but uh, we always work uh, by majority votes in the assemblies. So even if uh, there's not a consensus, to us, um, to us, it's the way to go if you want to build a massive movement. You can't always have everybody behind you, of course. Uh, I wouldn't want Stephen Harper to support my decisions. It would be weird. <laughs> it's normal to have some division sometimes. Uh, and for us, it's part of democracy to have some debates and to have some disagreements between the, the members of the General Assemblies. Um, even I would say that it's a good thing to have some disagreements because it forced people to look deeper in the discourse and have some uh, better reflections about the, the issues. Um, so yeah, all of the decisions are taken by the assemblies and, uh, all, and the, the assemblies were, were the official and are still the official decision-making body of all of the student unions in Quebec. So when a decision is made by majority democratically in the assembly, it is applied to all of the students that are member of the union. So even if there were sometime divisions, we had to apply those mandates. If it was a strike mandate, then it meant that we would have to uh, block the entries, uh, the entrances uh, of this, the, the universities sometimes or of the CIGIPs. If some students uh, disagreed and said <coughs> that they didn't want to go, uh, didn't want to respect the strike vote and still wanted to go to class, uh, that's the difference to us between a strike and a boycott, because a strike is a collective decision and a boycott is an individual decision. Uh, so, yeah. I will add only one thing. You know, one, uh, this whole structure of direct democracy and um, g general assemblies, those structures, and that's very important to say it, do not only exist when there's a strike. Those structures are the permanent structures of the progressive student movement in Quebec since the, six, since the 60s. And obviously when there's no strike, there are less general assemblies. There is between two and four general assemblies per semester when there's no strike. And there's between, there's generally two national congresses per, uh, per semester. So obviously when there's no strike, those structures are less active and there are less students in the assemblies. And that's, I think, 
normal and legitimate because you cannot ask for the students to be always super ultra mobilized one assembly per week. There's, it's normal that between the, you know, the eye mobilization, sometimes you fall a little bit and you have less students in it. But the fact is that those structures, they always exist. And because they exist in, during a long duration on, on, on time, you can create really a, democ a culture of, democratic, uh, of direct democracy in the student unions. And that is the difference in Quebec between the Anglophone and the Francophone campuses. The Anglophone campuses this year, a lot of them, not everyone, not all of them, but a lot of them decided suddenly to have a general assembly. But I mean, no one was used to it, no one was, and, and because no one was used to it, no one was willing to, in fact, respect, like Chloe said, the collective decision that was taking. So obviously, if you decide to create those, time, those type of structures in your, in your student union, it will be very long before, before they work. It will be very long before they actually, you know, welcome a lot of students, but it, in a, it's, it's because they exist in a long time that you can institute them and you know, make them really not only on paper, but in reality, the, the main place for political debate and political decision. So, uh, we've already got uh, several questions coming in over Twitter. Um, so I'm just gonna rhyme off uh, two at the same time. Uh, the first is from Penny Mills and she wants to know how can we begin to replicate uh, this movement from home? And the second is from Leo Fugaza and he wants to know how much of a role would you say CJEPS played in the strike's success and how could it translate to colleges and the rest of Canada? I'll start by the, by the second uh, question. Um, I would say that CJEPS had a lot to do uh, in the success of the strike because of the fact that, uh, as I said before, in the CJEPS you have only one student union for the whole institution. So that means from a few hundred to, a, like to up to 10,000 people uh, represented by one union. Oftentimes it's between two and 5,000 people. But it means that when the strike vote is taken, you have a lot of students that go on strike. So it adds to them to the to the amount of students that are on strike uh, compared to in the universities where oftentimes the votes are taken by the general assemblies of some smaller uh, student unions for example the departmental student unions that often represents only a few hundred people so uh, the impact of a vote strike in the CEGEP is more important than the, than the impact of a vote strike in a university um, I don't really, I'm not really, uh, I can't really answer the question about how can it, this one. yeah, I know, how, how can, can it transfer to the colleges in the rest of Canada, because I'm not really a specialist of uh, the structure of the education system in the rest of Canada, but uh, of course the CEGEP had a lot to do in the success of the strike, and uh, it was a hard thing to organize too, because it means that if you have more people, you have more disagreements. And the general assemblies are way much bigger. Sometimes we'd have some assemblies of o over 3,000 people in the same, well, in f a few rooms, of course, but uh, in the same assembly. So uh, the, the debates were intense, but it worked in lots of places, and we thank the CIGEP students for that. So for this, the first question that was about how can we replicate uh, the student movement at uh, home. First, the, the social movement is not peanut butter, so you cannot sp spread the same thing all over a country or a province. First thing, so, and it's not, it's, not butter, it's not peanut butter and it's not a science. So there's no magic formula or scientific formula that if you do exactly the same thing, it will gain it will give mathematically the same result. Uh, but let's say that, gen so, so what, what I want to say by that is that the idea of this, is, of this story is not to say we did that, so you guys should do exactly that and then it will give the exact same result. There are cultural differences, there are conjunctural and political differences everywhere, and the, and the idea of this tour is to give tools to the social movements all around Canada for them and then it will be the role of those social movements to take what tool they want and to do whatever they want with it to achieve the demand and the goal that they want. That being said, I think there are two main important things to remember about what happened in Quebec. The first thing is, like Chloe said it, uh, very clearly, is the, it's the perfect 
match in Quebec between democracy and structure. The fact that our unions, our student unions, are deeply democratic, they are con really controlled by their members, but the, the movement is also well organized. It's also well structured in a very uh, rigid and uh, formalized way. There's nothing spontaneous and uh, in, in the student movement in Quebec. Everything is really well organized. Sometimes it's even, you know, heavy to, to, to work in that structure. But the f what, is, what makes our power of mobilization is that our student unions are representative of everyone that is actually studying in, in an institution. It's not a voluntary membership. Everyone is a member. So it's, uh, so it's a mandatory membership. It's, uh, it's, it is uh, recognized officially by the government and by the institution. But it is also democratic. So this perfect match between democracy and structures is our first strength. Our second strength is, I think, what we have been able to do this year, like, 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 like was said before, is to be able to articulate two different levels of demand, being able to articulate a pragmatic and, and achievable goal with another level of demand that was a more systemic and anti-neoliberal discourse. And sometimes social movements fall in one trap or, or in the other. They, have, they are two cooperatives and they only demand things for, for example, their members or the people they represent. And because they are so restricted to an immediate demand, then it blocks any perspective of that mobilization to transform into a popular struggle because it is so uh, narrow. But the other trap is for social movements to think, and I've been asked this question, is not a joke, for example, how can we do a strike against austerity? Well, you don't do a strike austerity. You will do a strike against a very specific demand. But you have, what, what, what you have always to keep in mind is that you, you have to give meaning and uh, you have to give meaning to that specific demand by also articulating a general discourse. But, but you have also to be clear with your membership that you're not going on a strike against neoliberalism because you won't, you won't win that fight and everyone knows it. So that's really democracy and structure and articulation of an immediate, and a, uh, and, and, uh, of an immediate demand and a wide discourse that I think are the two main ingredients that can be exported elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, back to the audience for a question. Hey, hello. Thank you. My name is Wajit Seri. I graduated last year from the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. Um, my question is, um, on September 4th, Jean Charest came within 1% of winning re-election, and a lot of that was because of voter turnout, especially among the youth. My question is, how can such a successful and inspiring social movement not lead to people caring enough to vote? Uh, just, just, just very quickly Sorry. though, we don't have youth vote participation numbers and we won't for about another five months, okay. so I'm not sure we can draw okay. too many conclusions. Okay, but the total vote was 60% or something like that, it was still pretty low. I, I didn't understand okay. the question. Okay, that's again. Uh, Slower. Yeah, sorry. How can such a successful and inspiring social movement uh, still lead to such a low voter turnout at the election? I have, a, I have, a, I have two things to say about that. First. The turnout, the young voters' turnout was, we have to say, a lot bigger than in the last election. It was already a big step forward to have that participation rate. Uh, and second, I want to. I want to. I'm a student in history in in, in Quebec, and I want to. I want to give you uh, an example. In 1972, in Quebec, there was this huge uh, common front of all the public sectors. It was a huge strike. Um, and the three presidents of the three main unions in Quebec were put in prison. And after that, there was a huge uh, illegal and savage strike all around Quebec. Cities were occupied. It's probably the, the, the biggest social movement after uh, the, 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 the student strike this year. It was riots everywhere. It was really unbelievably, it was, and it was a popular uh, revenge towards the government. And the demand at that time was to have, it's funny, uh, a, a revenue of $100 per week for the public workers. And that, that was the demand, once again, very specific. It's, it's cool to, to, to see it again. But it was a huge mobilization. It was in 1972. The year after, there was a general election. In fact, six months after, beginning of 1973. And then the liberal government of Robert Bourassa was re-elected with a stronger uh, support than ever before. So then the left wing in Quebec was like, oh my God, we did that youth mobilization 
and then the liberals are re-elected stronger than before. So it was a total uh, depression. Everyone was so like disoriented about that issue. But three years after, 1966, what happened, one, uh, 1976, what happened? Well, the Parti Québécois was elected for the first time in Quebec. <coughs> and obviously, the Parti Québécois at that time is not the Parti Québécois of today. At the time, it was the only political vehicle for the Francophone working class in Quebec. So in 1972, it took, in fact, four years for the, for the, the social movement to give concrete results on the political level. So sometimes, you know, those kind of mobilization take time to penetrate a society and to be reflected into electoral politics. And you know, I always quote a, a, a German philosopher that said, impatience is not an argument. We have to trust our movements and ourselves and say that maybe this election, and I agree with you, was a little bit a deception. I mean, only, uh, I mean, the liberals have 50 seats. It, it, so the, 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 the resilience of the liberal voters is really uh, something that has to put to, to, to uh, it, well, it's very, uh, preoccupa it's a big preoccupation. But then, like I said, we have, I, 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 I am deeply convinced that it will take time, but that we will see this movement and we will see the consequence of, the, of that movement uh, on the political level one day, but it might not be this year. And I think history shows us also that it sometimes happened with social movement. And I did just want to clarify one thing. Turnout increased massively over the last couple of elections. So it's really wrong to say that there wasn't a spike in turnout. There's a massive spike in turnout. Um, Right, so it went from 64% turnout to 78%. So there was a really big spike, and I think a lot of that is directly attributable to the student movement. Um, so the, the tweet questions are coming in like massively, which is great, because I think that means there's a ton of people watching out there. So I'm just going to one really quickly here. Um, how do you counter the mass media propaganda against the movement? Uh, <laughs> I guess that's for me. Well, we we... We never really did it, in fact. Um, I mean, the, 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 the relationship between social movements and mass media is, is difficult, obviously, and we all know it, because we all share the same critics toward those you know, huge mediatic empire. And I can, I can say what was our strategy about that. It's always very long questions, but uh, what we did is that we had, a, we had a, a double strategy. The first strategy was to massively invest uh, and massively go in mass medias because we knew that they had problems. They were sometimes really uh, problematic towards our demands and our actions. But that, but that we needed the, their not them but their audience in order to have support for our cause. And we knew that having the best ideas and the best tactics was useless if we were keeping that for ourselves and that we had to share those tactics and those ideas with the most people as possible and obviously it was going to be imperfect and we knew it but we took the decision and the risk to put serious energy in that in, uh, in mass medias but and it's a very important position that does not mean that our tactics and our ideals were influenced by the mass medias. And that's really the line that social movements have to draw, to say, I think, personally, social movements have to use those, social, those mass medias as a tribune. But they have to be very careful that this relationship is a one-way relationship from the, from the General Assembly to the medias and never, and, and never the opposite. The, medium, the mass medias should never tell us what to do, what not to do, what to say or what not to say. So that's the first thing. And also, we did, we did a huge work in creating our own communication channels uh, by the social medias. The cash rolls is, is, the, is the best example. And also by distributing our own newspaper, our own flyers, our, our own in, uh, information. And that is very important to do. I'm not saying it's not important. I think it's a, it should be a priority, but we have also to invest mass medias in order to maximize uh, the, our, our, uh, the publicity around our demands. I'm just going to add something very quickly. Uh, another thing that's important to understand is that all of the decisions all through the strike were taken by the students and by the students only in the General Assemblies. So uh, during the Assembly, it was not only a way to for people to take decisions, but also to be informed of the real situation that was going on. So people that made the decisions, which were the students, 
were informed directly in the General Assembly. So they had some information accessible uh, in another way than by the mass media. So it was a really important for us to be able to speak with the students directly to give them the real information because sometimes mass media don't give the real information. So uh, unfortunately, we're only going to have time to take one more question, which we'll take from the audience. However, I'd like to remind everybody we're going to be going upstairs for, uh, for an after party, and we're all going to be there so you can come ask us. Uh, is it not upstairs, Derek? It's actually, it's actually right here. It'll stay here. OK. And there's also going to be a band playing afterwards, so I invite everybody to stick around. Um, what? Yeah. One question, guys, one question. I want to ask you, what do you think about Stephen Harper? I wish he could sign. That's a good question. I think we got time for another I'm question. I'm a fan. <laughs> right. well, sorry, sorry, we, the, we were, this guy was recognized. So first of all, thank all three of you so much. Uh, I work with university-based labor at SFU, and I'm a graduate student there, and you've already been an enormous influence to student and education-based education activism here in BC. So thank you again for that. Um, my question is the following. I've just uh, come out of spending a lot of time in the Occupy movement which also was based in quite a bit of direct democracy. Uh, there's an emphasis on, on participation and accountability. Uh, but at the same time, these uh, general assemblies from the Occupy movement were plagued with uh, various forms of interpersonal oppression, such as sexism and racism. So my question is, did you as activists have some similar experiences in Quebec? And if so, how did you deal with them? Um, sexism, racism, and discrimination against particular people. Of course, uh, Quebec is not excluded from sexism and racism and all of these oppressions, and they're present in, in the General Assemblies too sometimes. Uh, but we always had, uh, you know, we always made very, we were always very precocious about those things. And one thing that was very important for us in the General Assemblies in particular was to have some very, competent, competent uh, facilitators in front of the assemblies. Uh, we haven't been in the details of how the assemblies work exactly since now, but um, it's a, an assembly is a very uh, official instance, and so people have to uh, maintain a very strict decorum during the assembly, and the, the facilitator is there to make sure that all of the people in the assembly, whatever the, their opinion is, is to be respected uh, when, when they speak. And we have uh, also some mechanisms in our assemblies to make sure that, for example, we have uh, gender parity uh, when people speak. And uh, we have mechanisms like that um, to make sure that everybody is respected as, as, as much as possible. But of course, these oppressions are always present. We, we, but we, another thing we would do was to inform people of those things, because obviously when you're 17 and you're just going out of a high school, maybe you're not uh, the most aware person of all those things. So we uh, it would distribute also some information about these and make some workshops about those, those issues also. I would say that is totally true, but uh, our mobilization and our demands were not about those issues. They were about a systemic, uh, global attack that was made to every people in that province. Women, men, black, white, uh, workers, students, everyone was attacked by that measure. So our discourse and our demand was a general and, and systemic demand and not the addition of particular demands. And that's really important because totality I, is my philosophy students going out, but totality is not the addition of identities. Totality is also being able to go over the addition of identities to reach something like society and globality of demands. So it's really important that our movement does not replicate inside the movement the oppression structures of the outside society. And that, and that we all agree. But it's really important and that there's no, I mean, compromise to do on that. But the, I think, and I think that's one of the part of, is the part of our experience. Our demands and our and our political goals were global goals that would and a, and a global demand that would profit to everyone, what, whatever their specific oppression. And I think that that's also one of the key of our success. <laughs>